In the second half, we chat about his time flying the swing wing warrior, that is the Tornado IDS, what it was like to fly, what the cockpit was like, and also working with the navigator for the first time. So thank you and enjoy. Well, Frank, uh, one of my favorite aircraft is uh, the Tornado, and you're actually our first first um, Tornado pilot outside the RAF to be on the channel. So this is going to be fascinating for me. So I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say. Um, so yeah, how did you get posted to the Tornado after your 104 career? Um, our wing converted to Tornado. Right. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> like I told you before, I was the uh, the chief simulator officer, so to speak. I was in in charge of the simulator and also in charge of the uh, of the tornado simulator when it was uh, being built and uh, when it grew, so to speak, in 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 the wing. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, very closely connected to this, and because uh, because of this and because. We were not expecting too many aircrafts uh, right at the beginning, you know. Uh, there were aircrafts uh, coming slowly into the wing, but not many at one time. Yeah. So there, the the simulator had a big, uh, yeah, big uh, advantage, so to speak, to keep uh, converted or yeah, converted uh, pilots a little bit more. Uh, uh, valid for for their tornado. You know, right. after they came back from Cottesmore, uh, they couldn't fly the real thing right away. So the simulator was uh, one choice to keep them current. Yeah, that was why I, as uh, the head of simulator, went uh, to Cottesmore for the conversion training as the first pilot of my wing wow. so i was first first uh, who was ready thereafter and by the way uh, we had after the conversion uh, training also the flight instructor training uh, which was right thereafter in uh, cottesmore and uh, yeah then i went back to germany and flew tornado as much as I could. But yes, and we're, missed, we're, we're certainly going to get into that. Um, but I can imagine the tornado simulator was probably a bit better than the F-104 when you... <laughs> yes, it was. But uh, it's nothing compared to what it what you can have today, oh, uh, no, like yeah. Microsoft simulator or so. Um, you must... Yeah, if if you if you think simulator, tornado simulator, it was a whole building, you know. You had wow. a radar simulation uh, that was a whole room full of computers. Wow. The visible, the vision simulation was a full room, uh, full of computers. You know, it was it was incredible. There was a, a company uh, that took care of these. Uh, uh, hardware uh, stuff the 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 cockpit itself was a moving cockpit that was quite nice but uh, there was a company that took care of this and uh, i think it was five or six guys permanently in this building to maintain and uh, and, and and work on these uh, systems you know wow. to have them got them ready and, and keep them ready so what was the role of, I'm guessing it was it was it the Tornado IDS for the German Air Force? Yes, yes. So what was the role for, you know, the Tornado and the German Air Force? It was the same role as the 104. You know, it, uh, four airplanes in the QRA loaded with tactical uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, I don't know when they changed this. Uh, I think uh, a little later... Um, nowadays, I think only Büchel has a QRA uh, for this purpose. Uh, I, you can you can read this in the in the newspapers. Uh, we have only I think only one station, and that is Büchel, where there are tactical nuclear weapons in Germany nowadays, and uh, everything else has been 
the dawn back to the United States. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, same role as the 104. So let's talk about your training. You said that you were the first pilot to convert uh, on your squadron. So you went, I'm guessing you were, you flew on the Triple TE in Cottesmore. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, airplane training, uh, aircraft training, conversion, it's always the same. You know, you have an a, a academic portion, uh, three weeks or four weeks, something like that, and then you go to the flying uh no big, uh, no big difference from from any other conversion I, I took place in, and uh, the tornado, we had instructor pilots uh, from Italy, from um, uh, England, from Germany, and also the class was mixed. Uh, we had Brits and Germans and no Italians, okay. and it was. It was a nice, uh, a nice converse, uh, conversion. <laughs> and at that time, I must say, the O clubs, uh, there was some life in the O clubs. <laughs> I can imagine. Nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, it's all dead. Yes. I, I'm told. I have no experience as far as that is concerned. But uh, I also remember in the States, uh, the O club uh, was uh, something special. And also, when I was in Cottesmore, the O Club was uh, something special. There was always something going on, you know. But uh, Definitely this has changed. Nowadays. By the way, when I was in Cottesmore, the Queen visited that wing. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> yes. Did you get to meet her? No, I didn't get to meet her. But uh, I remember they built a special booth with a toilet for her. <laughs> That's what I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But uh, for the first time for yourself, what was it like working with a backseater? Because obviously you have to adjust to that being a single-seater um, pilot. At that time, I was 34, 35. And uh, I'd, flown, uh, I'd flown about 10 years uh, on the 104. And everything you had to do yourself. Everything. And... Uh, when you get a little older, I think you appreciate a little help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. Um, for me, it was a little bit uh, of support, so to speak, uh, the backseater. Um, I, I also, as a, as a flight instructor, had the uh, complete backseat training, of course, but backfleet and uh, we had um, training airplanes and uh, strike airplanes. The training airplanes had a fully uh, a workable cockpit for a pilot in the back, you know. Mm. Then you had to be able to uh, overrule the, the, the student pilot or the pilot in the front seat. Uh, the strike version did not have the, uh, uh, the stick and these possibilities. The thing is, uh, the... Uh, Weapon systems operator really supported the pilot. You know, the pilot could concentrate completely on flying, could uh, look out and, and, and check for other airplanes and check for other details outside the airplane. And the only thing he had to do was uh, to um, fly the airplane. And uh, if uh, there was an attack, a simulated attack or a, uh, something like this, he could concentrate on this uh, release uh, or the pickle button, the bomb button, was still a matter of the pilot, you know. Uh, you, the, the guy in the back seat uh, did everything else. And I remember when we, uh, when we were approaching targets, uh, the guy in the back seat had to uh, update the navigation system of the tornado. He did this by uh, using his radar. Uh, he had, in the preparation of the mission, he took some points uh, at some points along the route uh, where he knew exact the exact geographical coordinates. And then he marked these uh, positions when we were in the vicinity of that. He marked these positions with the radar and told the computer, this is it. And then the uh, you could see this on the uh, on the moving map also. The map went like this, 
and was on a new position, and this position was very accurate. Wow. And then, of course, uh, when you went to the target and hit the target, like let's uh, for practice bombs, for instance, uh, then the results were pretty okay. <laughs> Brilliant. So obviously, what was it like coming from the F-104 to the Tornado cockpit? Did it seem like an absolute leap? Or how did you find it as a pilot? The Tornado, the tornado cockpit was uh, much more spacey. You know, there was much more room for the pilot. And it was uh, also quieter. And uh, some people once asked me, what is the difference between the 104 and the, and the Tornado? And I kept saying, the 104 is like a Porsche, and the Tornado is like a Mercedes. Hmm. And that's how I felt about it, you know? Right, yeah. And so how did you find, obviously, the wing sweep? Was uh, the German Tornado's manual, or was it automatic? No, it's manual. And uh, I think the uh, British IDS... Not IDS, the British uh, yeah, Air Defence. Oh, F3, yeah. It's also auto, uh, uh, manual, right? Yeah, our our tornadoes were all manual. The GRs and the F3s yeah. were all manual, yes. I don't know why they uh, actually inserted or uh, introduced the 67 wing position. I have no idea because uh, with the... Uh, uh, 45 wing position everything was was fine we we never actually used the 67 wing position except if we uh, on on these one or two or three um supersonic flights that we did uh, right, there's so you never went to 67 no you don't need to but uh, when we did some uh, overshoots on on other airports you know if you go if you go low level in in the times i was flying we could go to frankfurt or we could uh, go to stuttgart not wow. not for landing but for overflight you know and then you requested a low approach at um, maybe frankfurt or stuttgart and then um uh, you put your wings to 67 and uh, had some good speed um, on the airplane, and when you were flying past the uh, tower, you just showed them your wing, yeah. your belly, <laughs> and uh, Tornado 67 wing looks cute, I think. It looks amazing. It certainly does, and, yeah. Uh, 67 wing, you don't really need it, you know. And on the ground, if, if the airplane was, uh, was fueled up, and you had to go, or you... you we are not allowed to go 67 wing on the ground because it would okay. sit on the tail yeah. uh, because of weight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So what was what kind of munitions uh, was the tornado carrying in, in your day? I couldn't really tell this. Uh, it was we we had um, folding fin air rockets which which was not very modern at that time we had uh, um, unguided bombs which was not very modern at that time we had the mw1 i think it was it was a a cluster bomb dip dispenser yes um uh, but i've never actually seen these cluster bomb uh, the M MW1 I've never seen mm -hmm. in life or on the tornado on the tornado, and uh, we most of the time flew with uh, practice bombs, a bomb dispenser where we had the six practice bombs loaded, and these six practice bombs we uh, we uh, practiced on the uh, shooting ranges, you know. Yes, and uh, I've never flown a live event uh, with the uh, tornado mm -hmm. and once only with the 104 with fallen fin air rockets that must have been fun though <laughs> yeah it was uh, <laughs> you know everything goes that fast you don't you don't realize it once you you release the, the rockets you have to pull off and yeah. uh, you don't see actually what you what you did so uh, did you ever conduct uh, ACM or DACT in the tornado no, never. You never, con uh, no. never trained for that. Right. 
So, like, you must have practiced in Germany getting jumped by other fighters. Like, what was your tactics for that? Well, the, the tactics was uh, if you, if you really uh, noticed that somebody jumped at you, you uh, the only chance in in reality, the only chance you had was to um, to drop the bombs, <laughs> yes. to drop your ammunition, mm -hmm. you know, and get away. Mm -hmm. And then the aim of the uh, of the jumper was was done. He he had mm -hmm. uh, pre precluded us or no, uh, made us not attack our target. Mm -hmm. you know, that was uh, his purpose uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. If he shut us down, yes, that was a, a two two wins, <laughs> but one <laughs> win was enough then Absolutely. for him. You know, but that was in that was uh, in in real life. We never carried uh, uh, life bombs. Also, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, if somebody jumps at you, you know, it was another tornado. Uh, other than that, at that time there was nothing flying in Germany except for uh, maybe F-15s or or something like that. But the Americans didn't do that. I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, I got never jumped uh, at by a F-15. Of, uh, yeah, the NATO fighters at the time, but how yeah. how how did the tornado feel? Did it feel like yeah, you said almost like a Mercedes, but did it did it feel maneuverable compared to the F one hundred four, or did it feel sluggish? How did it handle? Uh, it was very. It was not sluggish, you know. Also, if you if you uh, had to maneuver, you most of the time you went to twenty five wing then. You know, mm -hmm. it was uh, you could uh, turn a little uh, harder, but uh, this was like I said, this is an, an uh, IDS version. Uh, our our task was to attack targets and to fly low and fast, mm -hmm. and we we didn't turn. You know, you normally don't turn. Then you have a straight line <laughs> that you that you fly until you are at the target and then you give, you go back the only time you would uh, want to turn is uh, if somebody jumps at you uh, maybe absolutely so again i'm going to ask you this question because i want to know how like how many stories you have but a memorable story you had while flying the tornado none really it was it was uh, it was all like advertised you know um, like I said, I was lucky not to have uh, to tell those stories, you know. It was, uh, I didn't have any problems there. Yeah? Everything was uh, was working fine. That's probably good for you as a pilot. <laughs> yes, but uh, one thing that uh, in preparation of our, our talk, I thought about it, and I thought about the fact that my my memory is much more present for the 104 than the memory of the tornado okay right that's 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 kind of strange even though uh, the the flying experience is not so much different i, I have 14 50 hours on uh, on the 104 and 1000 hours on the tornado so uh, it's a long time but my my thoughts, my my memory is more intense on the 104. That's, yeah, I don't I think, know. I think, yeah, probably like it was your first frontline aircraft and it probably maybe resonated with you a bit more. But, uh, yeah, so what did you do uh, after your time in the German Air Force? Well, uh, at that time, I was running a, uh, a uh, software company, I did. Uh, I was in, involved in software developing, and uh, that's what I did then. Also, at the end of my uh, military career, I had the permission for for doing this job. I did software development, uh, database management, and things like that. Okay. At that time, that was before Windows uh, was uh, coming. Oh, okay, into right. <laughs> well, that was CPM. The uh, the operating system was CPM at that time. And uh, yeah, I didn't uh, continue this work uh, when Windows got more um, uh, modern. You know, Windows took over, and uh, CPM was not uh, in anymore. So that was it for me. I didn't want to. Uh, 
program in uh, on under Windows uh, operating system. Right. And then I, I quit my company. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've had an absolutely amazing career, like um, flying the 104 and the Tornado, the, the T-38. Yeah, what amazing career. But, uh, Frank, we have a, a couple of questions from our patrons, if you're happy to answer them. Go ahead. Right. So this is Alexander, who thankfully put me in touch with you. So thank you, Alexander. Uh, so his first question is, in your opinion, what was the main reason for the great number of losses in the early stages of the German starfighter era? Well, uh, the main reason were <laughs> technical problems. And uh, in the beginning, the uh, technicians and the pilots alike were not ready for this airplane, I don't think. Uh, the airplane was, uh, we, we didn't have experience enough uh, to deal with all the problems uh, they came up with. And uh, in the beginning, those airplanes were sitting out uh, in, on the ramp, no shelter, no nothing. And uh, the moisture and the rain and the, uh, the weather, you know, affected the uh, uh, airplanes, the interior of the airplanes, the electronics and, and things like that to a large degree, I think. There was a technical side of the problem and the uh, flying-wise, uh, you were not allowed to do anything wrong in the 104, you know, that uh, if, if you got behind the power curve once, then it, that was it. Also, mentally, Mm -hmm. You know, I, there was there was in the beginning not enough experience uh, for the pilots to cope with all the uh, uh, the problems the airplane uh, presented. For instance, uh, <laughs> I remember one story. Um, you know, the 104 had a kicker and a shaker. You know what this means? No. Shakers. If you go, if you uh, increase your angle of attack and it's, you increase it too much, then the air data computer says no and the, st the stick starts shaking. Right. And if you continue to increase the angle of attack, then uh, the kicker comes in and the kicker is exactly what it says. It kicks the stick forward. Right. Okay. Didn't know that. Okay. Um, this is to uh, avoid that you stall the airplane. Now, on our first dart mission, you know what a dart mission is? Uh, if you fly um, in the States, we had one airplane that was towing a dart. A dart is a, uh, a mock-up airplane, so to speak, on a line behind the towing airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... Uh, task of the second airplane was to shoot at this mock-up airplane with a gun. Right. The, the Vulcan cannon. So when I first did this, uh, they I had never flown or I had never shot the, uh, the, the Vulcan cannon before. And they told us, it sounds strange. It sounds like Right. That's what they told us. And you notice it, but you don't pay attention to this. So I'm up there aiming for this, uh, for this mock-up airplane and start shooting. And the sound, I was so um, excited, not excited. I, it was a shock, so to speak. I inadvertently pulled the stick and the kicker set in already and, and quickly. And it was not the shaker, it was the sticker. Oh, and right. The sticker. And I had my stick there, and the kicker went, chung, 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 chung. So I, <laughs> I kicked <laughs> behind the mock-up airplane. And uh, that was that was my first experience with a gun. <laughs> wow. I mean, why? Wow, I, I was just shocked, even though they told us how it sounded like, you know. Absolutely. And we've got another question here. It's uh, from another one of our patrons, uh, Jin Zhang. Uh, can you de can you describe any special tactics adopted by the Luftwaffe or Marine Flieger to overcome the poor sustained turn of rate in the F one hundred four? 
the pure sustained turn rate of the 104. Well, I, uh, like I said, the 104 didn't want to turn. Uh, and if you really had to turn, you would drop the uh, uh, the takeoff flaps, uh, light the afterburner, and pull as hard as you could. And normally, um, if, if we did air-to-air uh, combat maneuvering too, but it's it was 104 against 104, mm -hmm. you know, not dissimilar airplanes. Yeah. Um, the name of the game is, or the key to winning is energy. Uh, you have to have energy. Uh, you, if your energy level is higher than the energy level of the uh, of the uh, enemy, then you're going to win. Which meant actually that you had to be higher le le or faster high than the other airplane, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, that was a tactic that uh, uh, I personally tried to use right in the beginning. If somebody jumped at me, you know, I tried to get energy. I tried to get high above him. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's all I can say to this. No other than that, I have no idea what uh, I should, uh, how I should answer this question. No, that's no problem at all. Uh, we've got one, uh, another uh, question from our uh, patrons. He wants to stay anonymous, but um, how fast did you get in the 104 and but and the tornado? Uh, the 104, we made it uh, above Mark II. Wow. And uh, the tornado, uh, 1.3. I only had one. Um, oh. supersonic flight in the tornado because it makes no sense to uh, yeah. fly supersonic. And that was uh, during the uh, conversion uh, nice. over the sea. It was uh, uh, low level. I think it was four or 5,000 feet. We went Mach 1.3 and that was it. There's nothing to be sniffed at 1.3s. Uh, that's moving. <laughs> It's fast moving, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And especially if you are relatively close to the ground, then you, you really see what the, the speed is. Absolutely. And we've got a couple of personal questions here for you, Frank, if you're happy to answer them. Yeah, go ahead. So, do you have any hobbies? <laughs> yeah, my hobbies are photography and, and video editing. This is my hobby. And so, also, uh, I'm a ham, ham radio operator uh, since I was a kid. Wow. And, uh, and also, uh, I'm still flying, you know. This is another hobby of mine. Uh, I'm in the local flying club here. Used to be a flight instructor. I gave this up uh, two years ago. And uh, now I'm just flying for, for fun a little bit. Brilliant. This could be a difficult one for you, Frank, but favorite aircraft you have flown in your career? My favorite airplane is uh, definitely the 104. Um, uh, like I said, I, I thought it was sexy. <laughs> <laughs> it is a beauty. It's like it's a missile yeah. with wings. Design-wise, it's uh, so beautiful. I agree. I totally agree. And is there an aircraft you would love to have flown uh, during your military career that you didn't? Well, uh, as a as a fighter pilot, you want to fly all modern airplanes. As a matter of fact, you yeah. know, uh, if I see today how the uh, uh, modern U.S. airplanes perform or the modern uh, Soviet uh, planes perform, uh, it's just incredible. You know, really is, yeah. of course, I would like to fly those airplanes once, but I I couldn't. I had the choice or the 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 pleasure to fly. In, a, uh, in an F-16 once, and that was uh, also a very uh, memorable experience. Absolutely. So, Frank, I know you're, you have a YouTube channel, but where can we find you online? Is it just YouTube or you're on fa uh, Facebook, anything like that? Uh, share where we can find you online. No, it's just uh, I, uh, I have a Facebook channel too, but uh, I'm just using it to distribute my my uh, youtube uh, videos i post it once and that's it i i do not uh, um, 
how do you say, I do not uh, uh, make contact there. And my YouTube channel, you can find me uh, if you look for Frank Heinefetter, and that's it. Uh, nothing else. And what, so what kind of videos do you post on your YouTube channel? Oh, all, all kind of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, I, uh, in the beginning, I had a logo, which was uh, BSPG. Okay. And uh, nobody told me uh, or nobody knew what it was. And once uh, I never told anybody. And uh, finally, uh, I got weak and told somebody what it stand, stood for. And it was Bullshit Production Germany. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> that was at the beginning. So um, I don't know. Uh, you have to have uh, content. Otherwise, uh, it makes no sense to, to uh, play videos or to make videos, you know. And uh, my content is uh, in in this moment is my flying career, and I I do some some videos about this, and uh, there are really like this this guy who uh, this patron of yours, Fatter. Um, yeah, Alexander, yeah. Uh, there are there is there are, people are interested in how it was like the, at that time. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And you kindly sent me uh, your last flight. Uh, I know you did a German one, but you also did an English version, and that was fascinating. Watching your, you know, your Finny flight it was great. But uh, yeah. are mainly your videos in German, or do you also translate in English? No, uh, I have one or two or three, or maybe four in English. But uh, no, I concentrate on German. It's it's like easier for me. Of course, yeah. And obviously, I'll link uh, Frank's uh, YouTube channel below so you can take a look. It's great. There's some tornado stuff and F104 uh, videos up there, but um, they're great. But uh, yeah, Frank, I want to say thank you very much for coming on the channel. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it too.